Hola, 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 hola. I can't even say it. Hola. I'm still recovering. Hola, amigos, amigos, players, player rich, doo doo. That's everybody in between. Welcome back. Another fantastic episode, episode 102 of Game of Crimes. And of course, I am Morgan Wright, literally here with my partner in crime. Hey, everybody. It's Murph, and welcome back. Welcome back. All right. And thank you guys. Hey, guys, again, thanks for joining us. This is going to be fun, but before we get to the fun, we got to do just a quick bit of housekeeping. Head on over to Apple, Spotify, hit those five stars. Helps us out a lot. The reviews elevate us in the ranking, and they get more people exposed to that, that fantastic thing we call Game of Crime. So just head on over there. Also head on over to our website, gameofcrimespodcast.com. Got some good books there, like we put Abigail's book uh, there last week, uh, episode 101, Wayne Stinnett. So that's up there, along with a bunch of other great books. So make sure you head on over there, gameofcrimespodcast.com, but follow us on that thing they call social media, at Game of Crimes on Twitter, Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram, and make sure you head on over to go to Facebook, go to Game of Crimes Fans, join the select club that only a few have the honor of being a part of, because why? Because the queen, our favorite mafia queen, Sandy Salvato, ruling with the velvet fist, answer a couple questions, get <laughs> thank them, and you can see the hilarity that ensued with Game of Crimes fans. Right, Murph? Oh, I love it. Sandy, She's I love her to death, man. We just hope to get to meet her in person someday. Um, looking she's forward threatened to, some to cook cooking. for us and make us fat and not be able to walk or do anything, and I'm looking forward well, to see, that. I've already got one up on her because I've already got the belly. You know, I'm already there. So, But uh, it's it's amazing the stuff that comes across. But the thing I really like about that the the Game of Crimes fan club is that everybody looks out for each other. Somebody's having a tough time. They'll Community. put something. Yep. Everybody else jumps in and, hey, you know, I went through this. They're very supportive. Love you guys. You know, tell your friends. Let's bring more people in there. Let's just uh, love what you're doing, Sandy. You're doing a fantastic job. And thanks for everybody that belongs to that. I was going through a tough time and posted something, Murph, and you just wrote on there, suck it up, buttercup. Yeah, really helpful. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm here for you, brother. I'm here for you. All right. You know where else we're here for you at? We're here for you at patreon.com slash game of crimes. We just got through actually recording Q&A for June, not May, Stephen, not Seagal Siegel, June, June Q&A. We got some great questions there, so you got to head on over there, but we do, uh, we just did 911. Got it. I, Murph, I've already found the case for next month, double, double, triple quadruple twist in this one you're not going to see it coming we've got Sweet. uh the, our narco meter review our this next one we got coming out actually we did something we didn't do before which we reviewed season one of narcos next month we this month actually we'll we be reviewing season two of narcos and who better to do it than me because i know everything about Narcos. steve little dodgy on some detail sometimes like he forgot he was there <laughs> yeah. when yeah, you, you, you might want to wing it. So head on over there, but we got a lot of great stuff. So head on over to patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. Now, remember, folks, this is a show about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. We take the story seriously, but just like you've already seen, we're not going to take ourselves serious at all. This is going to be fun. Negative. And how do we know it's fun? Because we know it's time. What time? What time is it, Murph? What time is it? It's time for what is it time for? <laughs> It's time for Small Town Police Blotters. Dude, you've been in Florida too long. You are way too slow. Speed it up. Come on. All right. Hey, this one This one is in honor of our guest coming up. So our guest coming up is from the, is L.A., Lower Alabama. He is from the state of Alabama. So I got some good stories from Alabama, Murph. All right. You ready? Yes, sir. All right. This one, I can't give you the guy's name yet. It'll make sense in a minute. An Alabama man with a unique name is locked up on felony narcotics possession following his arrest earlier this month. This gentleman was busted on February 3rd following a traffic stop in Fayette, Alabama, population 4,285. Salute. A city about 80 miles from Hill's residence in Colum. According to the arrest warrant, rule no what's rule number one, Murph? Don't do meth. He was in possession of meth and drug equipment when nabbed by a Fayette County Sheriff's deputy. He was booked into the county jail on felony narcotics possession count and a misdemeanor paraphernalia charge. He is being held in lieu of a $1,300 bond. And he did definitely did not find his thrill this day because uh -oh. guess what his name is? Uh-oh. His name, his name is Blueberry Hill. I found my thrill. <laughs> really? His That's name his name. Is, 
His name is Blue. Middle name is Barry. Last name is Hill. Blueberry Hill. I wonder if his, you know, his parents might have been on meth when they named him. What do you think? I don't know. He definitely did not. Maybe he found his thrill in jail. I don't know. Don't ask. Don't tell. But I found my. That gives a whole new meaning to I found my thrill on Blueberry Hill. Okay. <laughs> You think anybody busted his chops when he was growing up? Oh, my <laughs> like God. There's like a boy named Sue. Yeah. You're not kidding. You're not kidding. All right. This next one is in honor of uh, one of our favorite Patreon subscribers, Frederick Nicolosi. Steve, this is a this is a tragedy of immense proportions. Uh-oh. What happened? Happened to, a, happened to four members of the Louisiana State University. I thought we were talking about Alabama here. <clears throat> it, it involves Alabama. They were coming okay. from Baton Rouge, okay. headed over to spring break to sunny Gulf Shores, Alabama, where everybody huh. was spending free break, right? Yep. So they were they were in an F-150 pulling a trailer, and Steve, when tragedy struck. Mm. They didn't drop their beer, did they? They were stopped by eagle-eyed deputies with the Mo- Mobile County Sheriff's Office. They noticed it was towing a trailer with expired plates, Steve. During questioning, the fraternity brothers consented to a search of the trailer, which happened to be packed with adult beverages to be enjoyed by Phi Kappa Psi. You know how much, uh, how much <laughs> contraband alcohol they took out of that vehicle, Murph? It's probably more than the Belgian beer you have in your basement. Since the truck occupants were all minors, deputies seized the alcohol. 106 cases of natural light beer, they call it natty. Five 12 packs of Corona, five liters of Franzia box wine, and liter sized bottles of tequila, rum, vodka, and Jack Daniels whiskey. They were all cited for being minors in possession. The seized alcohol will be destroyed. Destroyed, according to a sheriff's spokesman. Oh my God. And that was just for the five people in the car. <laughs> Four people in the car. And by the way, here's what makes this really drive home. Two days before the bust, one of the one of the uh, fraternity brothers posted a photo to his Instagram page showing him and four uh, other men posing with the cases of Natty Light piled in a truck bed. He goes, I think we have enough for spring break. And so one of the people that replied back says, so which one of you is 21? And this guy goes, we're frat as fuck. Uh, yeah, well, you okay. Uh, all righty. Did you learn anything? <laughs> No, no, because they're, they're college kids. They'll go back and do it again. All right, Steve. And in honor of our guest, uh, this huh. week, I came up with some strange Alabama laws. I wish we would have known these because I would have asked him if he ever enforced them. You ready? Yep. Yep. Boogers must not be flicked into the wind. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're kidding. It is illegal what? to impersonate a priest. <laughs> I've heard of, you know, you don't pee into the wind, but I've never heard about flipping flip a book. Well, that's not illegal to pee in the wind. That's just a life lesson. You don't piss into the wind. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, you don't fool around oh. with an old Lone Ranger, and you don't mess around with Jim. Anyway, um, I think he said don't spit into the wind, but I always thought for years I thought it said don't piss into the wind. Anyway, it's illegal to impersonate a priest. Steve, it is illegal to put an ice cream cone in your back pocket. Well, I thought that was common sense. Why well, race a good ice cream cone? And in Mobile, Alabama, bathing in city fountains is not allowed. Well, thank you very much. I'm something I didn't know. I'm glad I know that now. I, not that I ever planned to do that, but I won't now. And in our uh, Q and A episode, we had something dealing with uh, divorce and property and other stuff. So, Steve, did you know? And this is these next two are going to make sense to you, especially from West Virginia. Incestuous marriages are legitimate in Alabama. Oh, come on! Now. I got family in Alabama. I don't know about that. And, Steve, the final one, in case of divorce, women are entitled to keep all of the property they own before the marriage. However, this law doesn't apply to men. So what does that teach you, men? Treat your sisters nice because if they divorce you, you still might be able to get access to your property. <laughs> oh, and if you want to call Morgan and talk to him, dial 1-800-555. <laughs> no, I don't give a shit. I'm really quick and curious. I don't care. All right. <laughs> We're going to have to find out. This is what we're going to Our guest this week. Steve is is a is a we've had attorneys on people who have started off became attorneys, but this guy started off as an attorney, been an attorney, a district attorney, a, was uh, defense for a while, a DA. But uh, you actually ran into him along, and this was a uh, courtesy of another intro, I believe, right? It was well. I met Greg through, and our guest this week is Greg Griggers. Jeez, I can't even. Say, I'm having, I, you know, I don't even drink, and I can't talk. 
Greg Grigger. Greg, I apologize for messing up your name there, brother. Um, I met Greg through, how many and I had been uh, uh, contracted to come down and speak to a group in Demopolis, Alabama. That is LA, lower Alabama, the lower west side of Alabama. Extremely rural, but some fantastic people down there. And so we, we were having dinner one night at the, at the J.R. Rivas' uh, hunting lodge, and he brought in these guys and had some of the best steaks I ever had in my life. But you're sitting there with a bunch of cops from that part of the world, and they start telling stories. And, and because of what cops do, we like to tell war stories, right? And so one of them during the story is like, well, you know, Greg over there, he's our district attorney here. He's got his own story. And I said, what's well, just, you know, I'm thinking, well, he's an attorney. I mean, what, well, don't what tell him the stories, be? Murph. Don't give away the ending right. in the intro. All right. I won't. Uh, but he lived. I'll just, it wasn't like Pablo where he dies in the end. Yeah, he lived oh, and, twice. and that was the other thing. I was holy cow! After so, I went to Greg and I said, "Well, could you tell me your story?" And he was rather humble about it. You know, he didn't want. To, he wasn't bragging by any means, as you're going to hear his story here. But uh, I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, we've got to get that on Game of Crimes because you know this is all about portraying law enforcement. Where well, your your highest ranking law enforcement officer, wherever you are, is your district attorney. So that's why we got Greg on here. It's, you're not going to believe the two things that happened to this. And I'm just going to say he, right now, Greg, I love you as a brother, but I'm probably never going to travel with you. And, and our listeners yeah, do, will understand that after they hear this. He was all prepared to talk about the second thing that happened. He forgot about the first thing that happened. And when we brought it up, he goes, oh, that. And it's like, you got to be kidding me. How do you forget this? But yeah, you're going to you know find what? out. I, I'm not sure it came back as a good memory for him, as you'll hear on here. No, but 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 he but there's some uh, there's a uh, there was some uh, a silver lining to a lot of this about what it taught him too. But anyway, but Murph, yeah, there's only one way we can find out about what his stories are and why he forgot about the first one, and that's by me asking you: Are you ready to play the biggest, baddest, most dangerous, and lower Alabama friendly game of all, the game of crimes? Hey, I, I'm telling you, folks, get in, sit down, shut up, and hold on twice. Because you're going to hear two death-defying stories this afternoon from Greg Griggers. Folks, this is going to be a challenging interview. <clears throat> Why is that? Because, well, I believe I'm the only one on here that doesn't have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, uh, uh, you know, we'll just go to our southern ways and just leave him in the dust, right? Yeah. If, I, if you say bless your heart once, dude, I'm kicking you off this podcast. <laughs> I was just getting ready to say bless his little peace. Hey, I, heart. I already got you figured out. So, hey, as you guys can tell, we've got somebody on here with us. And now we decided to go to L.A. That's lower Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> no, we decided to get this is this is our first one, Murph. This is I mean, we've had people who have been attorneys, mm -hmm. but this is our first uh, interview with somebody as a an attorney. And so you are breaking ground, Greg Griggers from, where are you from? Demopolis, Alabama. What's that? <laughs> could, could you come up with a tougher thing to say down there in Alabama? <laughs> Demopolis. Or were you it's, guys like a combination between the Greeks and the Spartans or what? Uh, it's actually French. Uh, the French settled Demopolis. So, yeah. Ah, so do you speak French? No, I do not speak French. Do you want to? Uh, I would love to speak French. Yeah, actually, okay. I would. All right, comment all of us. Salve bien, très bien. So we shall we shall go from there. So hey, no, welcome, Greg Griggers. So Greg, first of all, welcome. It's great to have you on. And Thank and you. Steve, how did we get a hold of Greg? Well, I tell you what, we've got a a mutual friend, uh, Jr. Um, Jervit Rivas. Damn, I just forgot his last name. <laughs> yeah, good friend of mine. He's a real good friend of mine. <laughs> Uh, and Jr. has a place called the Soggy Bottom Lodge down there. And in, in, uh, is it what county is that, Greg? Marengo County. Marengo County. And he brought Javier and I down there to speak to the local police. Oh, it was last year, man. And we went down and they just treated us like royalty. Greg came out and met us. And that's not typical for a district attorney to come out and meet us at places. Sat through our presentation. Then uh, Jr. brought us back down there about a month ago and uh, talked to some uh, corporate officials as well, some other police officers at his headquarters, his business headquarters. And uh, you know what? Every guy we met down there just treated us like part of the family. The Southern hospitality, hospitality thing came out, met Greg, and just, you know, meeting him uh, as a district attorney, it, it there was no, he, was put, he wasn't putting on airs, you know, and I'm pretty sure if he had of, everybody called him out on, down there because they're all friends. That's the cool thing about it. They've got a system that works down there, a justice system that works. Um, Got to, I started talking to uh, 
um, <laughs> Clay. Murph, are we going to have to cut more of your short so you can have a Damn, nap? I didn't get my nap today, you know? <laughs> and uh, Clay's a retired DE agent. He's now the chief of Pale City, Alabama. And, and uh, Clay had a lot to do with making these introductions and getting us down there. So, And then it was funny because I kept telling Clay, I want to get Greg on the show, talk about his shooting. He's like, I got you, I got you. And you know how Clay is. He's always going a 1,000 miles an hour. And finally, the second time we were down there, I was having lunch with two Alabama state troopers. And I mentioned you, and I said, I've been trying to get him, get a hold of him now for almost a year. And he's like, one of the guys like, you want to talk to him? Hold on. Dials him right up, hands me his phone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. So, That's and, and I'm works. not dissing on Clay, man. He's a fantastic yeah. guy. I appreciate he sure is. He's done. Hey, so i got a question. Soggy Bottom, does that have anything to do with, oh, brother, where art thou, the Soggy Bottom boys? <laughs> well, it, it very well might. It <laughs> It's out I am there. a man, a constant sorrow, sung by the foggy, <laughs> soggy bottom voice. Hey, well, let, let's start talking about you for a second here, Greg. So, sure. um, you are a district attorney. So, tell, tell us a little. So tell us a little bit about where you are, what kind of cases you handle. Then we're going to get into you know what we're going to start leading into it. But let's kind of level set. Tell people where you are, kind of the area you're in, how big is the county, you know, what kind of what 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 are things like in Demopolis, Alabama, and what's the county again? Sure. Marengo County is where Marengo. Demopolis is located. Okay. Um, I have a three county circuit. Uh, it's the 17th circuit. Um, so I have three counties that I'm responsible for. Um, it includes Marengo, Green, and Sumter County. Demopolis is the biggest town that I have in the circuit. Um, in Sumter County, you've got Livingston, which is home to UWA, which is a small college um, that's located there. And then in Green County, Utah is the county seat, and it's the biggest town there. But uh, by far, it's a, it's a very rural circuit. Uh, it's, it's located in west central Alabama, about an hour south of Tuscaloosa, two hours south of Birmingham, about two hours north of Mobile. So uh, if you population for your for your circuit there, all three counties together, how big do you say think it is? Oh, you've asked me something, Morgan, that I, I – I'm, I'm going to be telling you something wrong if I tell you. I really, I have. Well, I'll just raise an objection and say, you know, facts, you know, assuming facts, not in evidence. So uh, just just you take know, a wild I, guess. I'm thinking Marengo County is probably about 18,000. Um, and then Sumter and Green combined uh, are probably about that. So, you know, between 35 and 40. So why, what is it, is it just something unique to Alabama or why did you have three counties come together to form a circuit? Is it simply because it was not cost effective to have a district attorney or a county attorney for each one? You know, I I would guess that. I I really, I I don't know. It's been, my circuit was, you know, it's been that that way for as long as I've, I can recall. uh, And I'm certainly not the only one that's that way. I mean, there are multiple circuits in the, um, throughout the state that there's one actually that's comprised of five counties. Um, that is just a little north and east of me. So, um, you know, it's it's different all over the state. If if you've got a big or large town, um, you know, in your county, maybe you'll just have one county in your circuit. But um, if it's rural, like my area is, then it's usually a multi a multi county county circuit. Hey, Greg, hold on, uh, and Murph, hold on for a second. We got to just do a quick dive in because we want to tell you about one of our favorite sponsors. And why are they favorite sponsors? It's HelloFresh. HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep, man. Skip the grocery store. And let me tell you, Murph, it's summertime right now. A lot of people want They still want the quality, right? So you get farm-to-table quality with every HelloFresh box. HelloFresh's seasonal ingredients are picked at peak ripeness. That means during the summer, it's peak. During the winter, fall, it's all peak. And they travel from the farm to your doorstep in less than seven days. And guess what you get? Fresh flavor in every single bite. And here's the cool thing. You know, I thought originally HelloFresh was just meals, but they've got some cool snacks and meals and, and, and things like their s'more bundles for the kids. I mean, how good is that? I, I guess I'm a kid at heart. I like that kind of stuff. But they've also got their bratwurst bar with caramelized onions, Dijonet slaw, and pineapple relish. They've got their snack board with pretzel bites, spiced bar nuts, honey, peach jam. How can you not like that? <laughs> well, man, that's but here's the thing too. With summer, everybody's busy. So when you need dinner ready, like now, what do you do? Look for the quick and easy recipes on the HelloFresh menu, including fast and fresh options, ready in just what Murph, fifteen minutes or less. Yeah, baby. And how how often have you been preparing a dish and you're thinking, oh crap, I forgot something. I got to go run to the grocery store. Well, you know, with HelloFresh, you don't have that problem because they're going to bring it right to your door. And guess what? It's even cheaper, up to twenty five percent less expensive than takeout. 
And, and you know, if we talk about one of our favorite meals, you and I were just talking about that. I think one of the favorite ones was the meatloaf. Remember the meatloaf? Oh. How good the meatloaf oh. good? <laughs> hey, I'm a Southern boy. That meatloaf rates down uh. here with Southern made meatloaf. And you know what? Our daughter is a big friend of HelloFresh. She told us a trick on doing the meatloaf. She said, here's what you do. I won't tell you it because it's a secret. No, about the, but, she, but I'm <laughs> telling you, oh my God, it, the, the meatloaf was so good, guys. But hey, look, you cannot go wrong, right? You cannot go wrong with HelloFresh. So guess what you do? You go to HelloFresh.com slash GOC16 and use code GOC16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. You're not going to get this anywhere else, dude. Remember, HelloFresh.com slash GOC16 and use code GOC16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. So remember, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Now, let's get back to talking about Greg and, and uh, finding out what really is going on down there in Alabama. Yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to find the populations here, and I'm not coming up with it. Uh, <clears throat> you got you to be able to type the name correctly, Murph. Uh, Got to spell it. Can you count this number? That, that's about the only accurate thing I'm going to get out of you tonight. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, hey, but uh, the other thing too, Greg, tell us what's the what's what is your standard fare of cases that come across from your area? What's what's the thing you deal with uh, predominantly? You know, it's, Morgan's really no different from anywhere else. I mean, and I, I hate to say that. I, I think it <clears throat> probably early in my career, which began full as a full time DA in in 2003. Um, you know, we, we seem to be spared, um, a lot of the violent crime that I saw in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham, Mobile, Montgomery. Um, but I'm sad to say that, you know, over the last 10 years, we've, we've picked up more and more and more of that. So, you know, we, we pretty much prosecute the same kind of stuff everybody else does throughout the state from, you know, capital murder all the way down to, you know, just property crime. And of course we've got our shared drug drug offenses just like everybody else so it's pretty much the you know the same gamut of criminal offenses that everybody has to see i guess maybe on a smaller scale because of numbers right. wise but um we see just about everything what, what do you think's driving what do you think drove and is driving the increase in violent crime uh, drug related uh, other issues poverty uh yeah, that's a good question. I think that's a question that certainly needs answering. Um, you know, if, if, if I back up 10 years ago, it seemed like all of the homicides that we dealt with and prosecuted, you know, you could put it, put your finger on a reason. It, it might be a sad reason why it happened, but, um, you know, you can always go back and, and find a motive. Um, Again, even if it was a, a pitiful motive, there was a motive there, but it seemed like more and more, you know, we deal with homicides that occur for, for really no reason at all. You know, you hear anything from, well, he said something to disrespect me. Um, you know, he played a song that I didn't like, um, took my shoes. Um, I mean, it just, it takes so little these days, it seems like to provoke uh, you know, violent crime. I I don't know what's driving it. I just know it seems to have changed. Um, it's gotten worse. Um, during 2020, I think we had a run there from like February through November where in Marengo County, just Marengo County, we picked up like six capital murder cases and another six or seven murder cases. And I say that and then put in context that there have been times in the past where I'd go five years without a murder in Marengo County at all. So wow. then all of a sudden we have a dozen in, in 10 months. So, um, I and don't that's know. It's a just lot gotten, for 18 to 20,000 people in a county. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's just gotten worse. And I, you know, it's, it's because of the people. Um, I, it's, I don't the want same, it's, it's the same pathetic to... excuses that other people use to commit murders everywhere. It's not a re it's not a reason. It's an excuse. And and you know, not to get on my soapbox here, but I will for just a second. In my opinion, we've become so permissive in our country that people think anything's acceptable. You know, it used to be people feared going to prison. Now it's like yes, you know, no big deal. It's three hots and a cot, man, and an yeah. education. And I looked up the uh, population of three counties, and, and you're right at about thirty eight thousand for all three combined. Oh, so any gangs dealing with any gangs or uh not really. I mean, you know, we'll we'll have uh, we'll have some people that maybe will move in that come from um Chicago or somewhere like that that have been affiliated with a gang before they came 
to to our three counties, but um, there's never been anything here that's very substantial. I mean, they'll, you'll have small groups that are form and call themselves something, but it, it doesn't really organize. And I mean, it will cause friction if there's a another group that that they can't get along with. But you know, nothing nothing like you see in the bigger towns where it's really structured or organized. It's just um, I don't know. I mean, I think they just call themselves something but it's it's gangs <laughs> gangs are not our problem no it's not about, it's not gang are there any remnants of the clan left over that you deal with no i, I can say you know i mean i've been prosecuting since uh 2000 and it's never never crossed my radar cool well let's we kind of set the stage so everybody's kind of got an idea of this but well, let's go back think of ours cosa nostra how did you get started in this uh this this profession. I mean, uh, what I mean, were you watching old reruns of Perry Mason and decided you wanted to win a case and not lose one to a defense attorney? I mean, what what got you going down this path? Um, you know, I, I got to come home in I think it was 96. Um, my only exposure to criminal law prior to that was I, right out of law school. I did do a clerk ship with a, a judge that sat on the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals. So that's really how I started out of law school, which was, you know, the first time I had really had any exposure to criminal law at all outside of law school, of course. Um, well, let's uh, let's rewind just a little bit before that. What made you get into the legal profession? I mean, what did you study in college and why did you decide, hey, I want to be an underpaid public servant? I was a I was a farm boy, so I went to Auburn to get a um, an ag whoa, whoa, degree. War Eagle? <laughs> you went well, to, no, are we allowed to have somebody from Auburn on here, Steve? I, I, I'm I an know. Alabama I fan it. now. I went to Auburn because I was a farm boy, but I never changed my allegiance. So okay. that was a difficult existence for four years. But uh, it's a fantastic school. But I got I got an agribusiness economics degree undergraduate and towards the end of it i just i I don't know i just wasn't really that pleased with the job opportunities that i had with that degree i didn't really want to go to work for a large agricultural corporation or an ag lender so um i had a couple of friends that had had gone to law school and it seemed like something that interests me and so that's what i did and then where'd you you go uh, i went to alabama Oh, well, so you uh, finally, yeah, look at, what's what's the name of the law school at Alabama? Just the University of Alabama School of Law. Oh, okay. Every now and then it's somebody, it's named after somebody rich, and I figured maybe it's the, you know. Um, well, it probably won't be long. It'll either be called Bear Bryant School of Law or Nick Saban, Saban. School of Law. <laughs> By the way, I got a bone to pick with you. You took our offensive coordinator from Notre Dame. You stole Tommy Reese from us. I'm a little pissed about <laughs> you and Nick Saban doing that. <clears throat> well, <laughs> We don't know what we got yet, so I can't <laughs> no. say much about that. Well, but you know, Saban's got a good habit of, uh, you know, he, he's a kingmaker, man. He mm-hmm. doesn't miss much, but we'll see. Well, we'll see. This name, image, likeness stuff is totally upending uh, college football. So we'll we'll see what happens this no year. No question. Anyway, so you, you you go to University of Alabama Law School. Correct. Um, and they say, so you clerk for, but now during your law school, did you, didn't you have to do anything like a moot court or do any like a trial and it's even some minor exposure to criminal law? Yeah, I mean, uh, d- did do moot court. Um but that was about the only exposure that I got to it. I mean, I, I realized I had an interest in criminal law just when I took criminal law, criminal procedure in law school. I had a fantastic professor there that had been a United States prosecutor, um, you know, well thought of. I can't remember where she was a, a U.S. attorney, but um, she she kind of made me be interested in it because she was such a good professor. But it certainly wasn't something when I – was getting or nearing graduation that I said, you know, this is, this is what I'm going to pursue. I just wanted a job. And, um, what were you looking to do? I mean, you, you didn't like agribusiness, but you know, you get, went to law school and you, so now you spent seven years in school and you still have no flipping idea of what you're <laughs> no, going to do. And, and, and it's true, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that I'm the only person in my family that's ever attended law school and, and no, you know, n- no exposure to it at all. So it wasn't like so many people in my class that grew up, you know, in, in their father's law firm or kind of knew, you know, what they wanted to do. I, I really, I, honestly, I didn't have a clue. All I want, knew that is when I got out, I need to get a job. And so when Judge Taylor came and interviewed on campus um, and offered me a job, you know, I knew I had a job. So that's what I took. But then I ended up really liking it. Uh, I wanted to be a lawyer, though. I didn't want to just sit around writing opinions, you know, for the Court of Criminal Appeals. So 
you know, the first opportunity that came by, I took a job in Tuscaloosa, but now it was in a civil practice. It had nothing to do with criminal law at all. Um, I was there a couple of years before I got a chance to come home. And when I came back to Demopolis, I did um, start taking criminal appointed cases. So I was doing defense work at that point uh, and did that up until 2000. And that's when uh, I got an opportunity to work for the DA's office. The DA at that time offered me a part-time job prosecuting criminal cases in Marengo County. So that's, that's how I got started. So what was it like on the defense side? I mean, for me, it was miserable. Um, I, I just didn't enjoy it. I, right answer. Uh, why? Because everybody you dealt with wasn't innocent was or gu- was guilty. No, they, they weren't. And, um, you know, it, I mean, I say I enjoyed, I enjoyed the trial work because, um, that's always what I wanted to do was, was litigation. And, you know, you don't do, um, a lot of litigation when in your civil practice. So, uh, I did enjoy that, but, uh, I just, you know, doing it from the defense, I just didn't suit my personality. I don't think, I mean, I felt like I did a good job of it. Um, I had some success with it, which bothered me. You know, when you, when you get somebody acquitted that, you know, uh, is guilty, then you got to go home and you got to deal with that with your conscience. So, you know, you say, well, you did a good job, but did you do a good thing? So, um, uh, but you know, but, but I, you know, even from the other side, I would argue is that uh, I would, it's not your job. It's not your job, right? Again, we all go back to the burden of proof is always on the state. If they don't meet their burden of proof, that's not your problem. That's, that's correct. their problem. That's correct. And, you know, I, I haven't lost a lot of cases as the DA, but those that I've lost, you know, it's either because we just couldn't quite put all the pieces together. But, you know, the lawyer on the other side did a good job of exposing whatever weakness we had. And, you know, that's that's what I did when I was a defense lawyer. But, um, you know, I, I, it, it was certainly it suited me um, when I got an opportunity. And it was kind of a an odd thing. I'll never forget it because we we had a, a bad period of time where we had a, a guy that had gotten elected to, to, to be the DA in, in our circuit that just didn't do a good job. And he let a bunch of cases uh, stack up and backlog. So when the DA that, that hired me took over, I think it was in 98, um, he had a huge backlog of cases. So he had what was referred to as the rocket docket, where he brought in judges from outside the circuit uh, brought in the um, the attorney general's office to assist him in prosecuting cases, and we were trying cases in three different courtrooms all throughout the day for for a solid week. And so it was kind of chaotic, but he got a ton of cases moved. So during that week, I think I defended like three cases, and then at the very tail end of the rocket docket, I switched hats and prosecuted a case at the very end. <laughs> and good. um. And and I and I could tell immediately that that that's what you know I wanted to do. So um, from that point on, um, I prosecuted part time up until January of '03, and then that DA uh, retired, and, and and I got appointed, and I've been so, the DA since. So that's like playing defense for Auburn and turn around and playing offense for Alabama. Yeah, it was yeah. it was strange. It was it was a little different, but um, well, let's you know. talk, let's talk about that. You almost didn't make it to law school. Uh, what do you mean? Weren't you on a traveling somewhere? Oh, 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 oh yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. This, <laughs> how do you forget something oh, like that? Airplane that? incident. Yeah. Yeah. That was quite an experience. Um, yeah, let's, let's tell people that because this, this, this whole podcast episode, this whole story almost didn't happen. Yeah. You thought we forgot about that stuff, don't you? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm a firm believer in what, what, what goes on in your life, it shapes you and, and kind of makes you who you are. And so that certainly had an impact on me. Um, yeah, we were just, um, my family owned some property in Montana and the normal uh, flights that we took went to, we, we'd fly to Jackson, Mississippi. We'd connect in Dallas and then we'd go from Dallas to either Salt Lake City sometimes. And sometimes we'd get a direct flight into Montana, but we were going from Dallas to Salt Lake that particular day and um, flying commercial, flying Delta, and um, just didn't work out. I mean, we crashed on takeoff. Um, well, now, was, you're skipping a lot of this. I mean, it, let's talk about this a little bit, because this 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 was kind of a bad accident. 13 people died, right? Um, I can't recall the, the, the number of fatalities, but it, what I do recall is it was pretty much everybody that sat but behind us uh, didn't get off that plane except for two young girls that sat right behind me that were about my age. And I want to say one somebody that sat uh, behind my 
stepfather and my brother who were sitting across the aisle from me got off, but everybody from us behind us uh, did not. What happened? Yeah. Uh, you know, it was just a pilot error. Um, I think when they took off, it was they had the flap set in an improper position. So we just got up to a certain altitude and it just stalled. And once it stalled, it was just nothing. It, it was coming down. It, he tried to get control of it. But it's kind of like when you hydroplane, you know, you know, you've lost control. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, you got that feeling immediately. Did you have any time to prepare? Oh, sorry, Steve. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, it, I mean, maybe, you know, just a few seconds. I mean, it, like I said, w- once it stalled, it rolled. And it, so it went like way over on the side, you know, something that you just knew instinctively was so bad that it wasn't, you gonna you weren't going to recover. And um, Pop had gone to sleep. I mean, he was over there sound asleep. And I reached across the aisle and slapped him and said, wake up, we're crashing. And he looked at me and said, no, we're not crashing. I said, we're crashing. And I was trying to, you know, I was just trying to get in a ball and it, we rolled like that a couple of times, like from side to side where we would be, you know, just si- completely sideways. And then he, he did a pretty good job of getting almost level by the time we made impact with the ground. But, um, it was, it was quite an ordeal. Did you, did the pilot call out any warning? No. Um, it wasn't anything like that. I, I, the only thing I remember is, you know, I, I realized it wasn't going to be good. Um, I guess, you know, your mind was telling you, you're probably not going to survive this. So I was trying to figure out what to do. So I was just trying to get in a position that I thought maybe would give me some chance of, of surviving. So I just kind of got in a ball with my feet pushed up against the chair in front of me and was trying to, trying to just get myself in a ball. And I remember I allowed myself to look out the window one last time. And when I looked out the window, the whole right wing ripped off and a big old ball of fire went up and I just closed my eyes after that. And that was about the time we struck the ground. And then we, we skidded and bounced for a long time. You didn't think it, that was ever going to end. So I was pretty amazed when it stopped that, you know, we were still sitting there in one piece, but it was, um, it, the, the plane was already on fire and you couldn't breathe. It was the smoke had already gotten so thick. You couldn't see. And it, you know, everybody was trying to get, up and get out and we were you know we were like the aisle that would be immediately behind the wing and so you knew you weren't getting off um because there were so many people ahead of you and just it, just one of those things i mean i i looked up and i saw sun sunlight and in the either the bouncing after we made impact or from impact it had cracked the fuselage just right behind where we were, where we were seated on the aisle. And so I stood, I climbed up on the seats on where my pop was sitting and they pushed my legs and I went up through the top of the plane and just kept wedging and wedging until I made it through, you know, I mean, it was just wires and metal, but finally I popped up through the top of it and wedged myself out and, and got on top and then you had to jump off the top of it which was i don't know how many feet it was but it was when you jumped you realized oh lord this is a pretty good jump but yeah. <laughs> it, it broke pop's leg in fact when he jumped off of it Jeez! now they i'm so we read that 94 people survived but 13 didn't quite make it and and not to sound morbid but did they die from the crash or from the smoke or the fire or you know, from what I recall here, and it was mostly from smoke, the smoke inhalation because the smoke was just so bad. Um, there was a young family that sat, the fuselage ended up cracking there where we ca- crawled out and it also cracked somewhere up towards the front. And I think there was a, a family, a, a, a mom and a daddy and two small kids that just unfortunately were seated right where it cr- cracked somewhere up towards the front. And I think it just from the, the, the damage that it caused to the fuselage, it killed them up front. But I think everyone behind us that died, died just from the smoke. And your family members, other than the broken leg, was everybody okay? Yeah. We, I mean, you know, it was, it was like getting out on a, on a skillet. I mean, it was so, it, it was burning. So it was so hot. You couldn't even put your hands down because it would burn your skin off by the time you pre- tried to press down to get out. So it took a while to be able to get out. And just from that, uh, alone me and pop both had like 
pretty bad burns on our hands and our arms. Somehow my brother moved quicker than we did and he didn't have as bad of burns as we did, but pop had to have some skin grafts in his hands and in his arms. And I, I, luckily I did not, I was younger and, and mine healed without having to have grafts. But, uh, yeah, we, we got away basically unscathed, you know, in light of what we went through, it was very minor. Man, that's a, a good man upstairs looking out for you that day. Just no wasn't question. Your day to Just go. wasn't but, our day. So well, out of curiosity, how long was it before you flew again? You know, I flew home. Um, it was one of those things where at the time um, we were, Pop was so into what we were trying to do in Montana. We were trying to get a cattle ranch started up there. And so we were going up there pretty frequently. And, um, you know, it was either fly or, you know, just give up on that whole deal. So, um, you know, it's kind of one of those things you just realize you had to do it again or else you weren't going to do it. So, um, once we got discharged, I think pop stayed in the hospital for about five days and, and so did I. And when they, uh, they discharged us, we just said, you know, let's fly back. And, and we did not, I, I go through spells where I can't fly. I'm going through one of those now. I don't think I could get on a plane if somebody told me, you know, I needed to next week. Um, but then, then I will fly. So it just kind of comes and goes. The anxiety really doesn't ever get any better, but, um, I have flown. I think I, I think I've flown in the last five years. So I flew out to California for a DA's conference. So did you have a bunch of uh, attorneys tracking you guys down? I mean, things like that bring out, you know, obviously lots of litigation, lots of lawsuits. Yeah. Yeah. There, it, that certainly in the aftermath of all that there were. Well, wow. Wow. Hey, I'll tell you, so you can look up this name too. And you folks listening out there, look up the name Dave Sanderson and just put a uh, miracle on the Hudson. So if, uh, actually a buddy of mine was the last guy off Captain Sullenberger's plane when it landed in the Hudson. Yeah, and that's, that, that story's unbelievable. Well, what's unbelievable is that is the only, um, quote, crash where there was no loss of life, I think, at that point in, in aviation history. A lot of the other times when you had crashes, you know, what they qualify as a crash, like in yours, people died. And, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, that's just, I mean, that's... And people, it just ticks me off. I, and I'll tell you, because of that, I mean, I take the safety briefing seriously. But, man, I, I, there's been sometimes I'm sitting there, I've actually said, hey, guys, can't, just hang on to your conversations for a minute. I mean, I've, I'm a 1K. I've, I've got 2 million miles on United. and But I, I learned a lesson, and this one's a lesson for me, too, but it's a friend of mine. It's like, no, man, I listen to the safety briefing every time. If I'm listening to something, it comes out. Because you got to know where those exits are. you got to know. You know, I, I try to get, if I'm not in first class, I'm always in an exit row. Mm-hmm. And I just try and, you know, it's just, it's amazing how many people blow those things off. And it's like, how many people that day do you think ignored the safety briefing? No, I, I totally agree. And I, I, I am very conscious of that when I get on one. Um, I don't, I do not like sitting on that aisle that we were sitting on. I always request something besides that if we, you know, when we get our tickets. But um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's it can happen. I mean, I, we're, we're proof positive that it can. So. Uh, I, I certainly you want to talk to about it. a mic drop moment when somebody it's like you'd be sitting there asking somebody to be quiet and it's kind of like have you ever been through a crash? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it, it, I mean, you know, it, it was it's it's one of those surreal experiences. I mean, it's hard to even go back and even now and believe that it happened. You know, we were sitting out because it was me, my brother, and Pop. Like I said, two young girls about my age that sat behind me that all came up through that hole. And so we ended up, and then there was an older couple that came out one of the exits on the wing. And so we all ended up in, in one little group on, on one side of the plane. Well, everybody else exited out the front and they went the other direction and we couldn't see them. So for about a minute or two, we thought we were the only ones that got off the plane. And literally by the time everybody's feet were on the ground, there was a flame coming out of that hole that we came out of probably 30 feet high. I mean, it, it was burning within seconds of us getting out. And so we just figured everybody had burned up. And so you're just sitting there looking at this huge 737 burning up and trying to reconcile that you just climbed out of it and, and that everybody else on there had perished. And then we finally, we got a glimpse of a group of people. Once they got far enough away, we could see them on the other side of the, of the plane, which was, was, uh, a relief to know that you know a lot of people had yeah. made it off, but well, and that's the thing too on takeoff, right? You got, you got to put enough fuel on board to get you to where you're going. It's not like you know you've flown somewhere and you're coming in for a landing, so you've burned through a lot of fuel. So that yeah. that thing was fueled to the extent it needed to be to that's get right. you to your next destination. Wow, yeah, 
Well, you know, that's, that's, that could be a whole story in and of itself, but that's yeah, kind of what we yeah. said is that, well, but let me ask you, how did that event like that shape the way you view things now? I mean, like going to law school and, and doing the work that you did, did that have an impact on you deciding what you wanted to do or how you approach things now? Because, I mean, you think about that, you almost got your ticket punched and it's like, man, that, that puts a whole different perspective on it. No, I, I mean, I think it definitely did. I mean, um, you know, you realize that you had survived something that some, you know, not many people do um, and that it could have very easily had been your day. And so I think, you know, you, you certainly have a, a newfound appreciation for every day. Um, um, I think I've always been somebody that valued the little things a lot more than the big, but, um, you know, I tried to, I tried to appreciate everything after that because I realized how, how fortunate I was to, to continue on. But um, as far as how it shaped, you know, what I did in, in college and whatnot, <clears throat> I don't know. Um, I, I definitely think it changed my perspective on things, but uh, it'd be hard for me to define exactly how. Well, mm-hmm. well, did it change how you looked at taking risks? Like some people might say, hey, hold my beer, watch this. Did that did it affect, you know, anything like that for you? Or did you do the typical, you know, foolish college stuff? No, I mean, I, I've never been a big risk taker. I've never felt like, um, and I don't think it really kept me. It hadn't really kept, the only thing it prevents me from doing is flying. It's flying. I mean, I just, I, it scares me to death. But other than that, um, I, I'm not scared of much. I mean, I'm not one that's scared of heights or whatever. So, um, you know, I, it, I don't feel like it made me a fearful person other than flying, but, mm-hmm. um, it, wow. it definitely affected that. I think that's quite understandable. <laughs> well, there's a story you don't hear very often at a cocktail party. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not sure, so I'm not making light of it, but it's like, but, um, you know, you think about all the stuff, this BS that are, people are talking about, and it's like, you know, you're sitting back there with the story that if you told it, it's kind of like I said, that's like a mic drop moment. That's like, mm-hmm. boom, you know. Well, let's, let's, let's pull out of this um okay and let's go back to where we were because we we were at that point where i said you almost didn't make it you know out of law school do you're doing your stuff so you do the rocket docket you you're defending and then you're prosecuting now you get a a part-time job and you said that uh the person who was um the district attorney retired and then that was yeah now do you have is that an appointed or is that an elected position it it at that point, for me, it, it was appointed because the DA that was retiring still had a couple of years left on his term. So I had to get appointed to fill out his term, and then I had to run. So I had one year that I just um, I served, and then into the second year, I had to run for my first term. So uh, from then on, it was elected. Now, did you have any competition that first time? Yeah, I did. Actually, the 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 guy that had been the DA for that period of time that I described earlier where where the big backlog of cases had occurred, he ran. Um so and in fact I ran against him four times <laughs> the last wow. time being last year. But it, has he I mean we call it a clue in law enforcement, but has he not picked <laughs> up on this that he's just not gonna win this one? Um he might want to wait till you retire. <laughs> apparently not. But, well, um, but, yeah, well, so if, I, but if he retires, you'll go back to having a huge backlog and you'll have to come back out of retirement and solve this <laughs> issue all over again. Well, and you know, and I, I should say that the, the gentleman that hired me, he did just that. I mean, he had served as DA for 20 something years. Um, I was so ashamed. I, I did not know who he was. I didn't know what the DA did uh, growing up. I actually went to law school with his daughter. And one day she was asking me about, you know, don't you know my dad? You know what he does? And I was like, no, I don't have a clue who your dad is or what he does. And then, you know, then you fast forward those years and he ends up giving me a job. But um, he when when he got beat, I guess it would have been in 92, um, he came back and ran for – his office again in 98 and he was, I think Mr. Nathan was like 68 at the time, but it meant that much to him to get it back and try to clean it up. Um, and he did, he did, he did a heck of a job cleaning it up up until the point in time that he retired. Um, it took a lot more time to get it back to, to where it needed to be. But, um, you know, it it was that important to him. Um, I've always admired that about him. Yeah, it's like a calling. It's just like going into law enforcement. It's not for everybody. 
Well, so up until that, we're, we're going to talk about a case you were involved in. Uh, it was the ambush against you by a former state trooper. But before we do that, um, just kind of give us a perspective, like in, in in all your years now, like how many cases, I mean, just take a, take a wild guess. How many cases do you think um, you've prosecuted in that time? Oh, Lord. Well, I, I really, I know I would miss the mark if I even tried to do that. I mean, understand, in, you know, in my circuit, unlike a lot of the circuits in, in, in the state, um, I guess because we're rural, because we're small, um, we don't have much of a, a budget from from the state. So, you know, I my job is not administrative. I mean, I'm the primary prosecutor in my office, so I've prosecuted the vast majority of my cases for the past 20 years. So, you know, if cases, I, I mean, there have been those exceptions, obviously, like in a week, maybe where I had a capital murder case that didn't take but two or three days, maybe one of my assistants would come in and try a case at the end of the docket. But so, you know, when cases get resolved, I mean, I'm usually involved in them. So I don't know how many a year I've averaged trying over the last 20 years, but um, I mean, it's hundreds at this point. How do you make the decision? Uh, wh- what are the things that you calculate that you weigh when you decide whether to take this to trial or cut a deal? I, mean, I think, you know, over time, obviously, you develop a uh, a sense for what you think is um, justice in a case and, and what you think is a fair resolution. Now, you got to bear in mind that, you know, just because I think uh, justice in a case might be X, you know, in order to get there, obviously, I've got to have the evidence to get me there. And and that doesn't always happen. I mean, you know, either you just can't find it or you can't get it or it's not persuasive enough or, you know, I mean, there's there's so many variables that go into what we do as prosecutors. People just really don't have any appreciation for it. I mean, you know, you may have a witness that is the best witness in the whole case, but, you know, a month or two months before trial, they move out to the West coast and you can't subpoena them and you can't get them back. Um, so, you know, you, you got to factor all that in. Um, but if you've got, you know, if you've got the evidence, you know, that you can prosecute a case to a conviction and, uh, you know, usually just in my mind, uh, I, I decide what I think is, is a fair outcome. I make that offer to try to settle the case. And if they don't accept it, then it's on them. Is that, is that typical that you'll offer, uh, oh yes. Agreement. Yes, sir. We. I mean, as soon as we indict people, as soon as we get out of grand jury, usually within thirty days, you know, written offers are submitted uh, in an effort to get cases resolved. And um, you know, you, you realize that you've got to, um, in order to get cases resolved, you know, you've you've got to be fair. You've got to. Uh, sometimes you've got to be able to, to compromise and concede some points, but. Um, that, because, you know, the vast majority of our cases do plead. If you try to, to go to trial with every case that you, you resolve, you, you'd never get anything done. So, um, hey, yeah. So, I mean, so what's your philosophy when you've got, like, you've made an offer, they've refused it, then they go to trial, and then they realize, ah, eh, things are going south, and they said, yeah, we'd like to take that deal. What's, wh- what do you do at that point? It, it, you know, they don't have a deal. Once you strike a jury, the deal's gone. Um, that's our rule. You know, we, we usually we put a a date on the on the offer. You know, and, and it usually expires sometime prior to the trial week, just because if if it's a big case or if it's complicated, it's got a lot of moving parts. You know, there's a lot of preparation involved. So I'm not going to spend a week preparing a trial and then they decide they want to take my plea uh, offer the week. I mean, you know, the day before. So you know, we 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 put an expiration date on it we say if you're going to accept it this is the date you've got and after that if you're going to plead you're going to plead blind how many assistant DAs do you have in your in your judicial district i've got one full-time uh, assistant and then i've got three part-time and that's so, to cover three counties yes sir wow so you you drive. I mean, so the thing is, somebody in uh, Marengo County makes an arrest. And obviously, everything takes place there. But then you got to go to the other county or the other county based on cases there. So, what's your what's a, what's a week look like for you? I mean, um, do you make the circuit? You know, so to speak, like the circuit. Do you have days that are set for each county, or how does that work? Yeah, the the judge comes out with a calendar, and you know, it sets. You know, we have basically the same thing in each county. So. You know, we have basically the 
you know, the, the steps in our process in circuit court, once, once cases are presented to a grand jury, we have grand jury that meets in each county. And then after we get our cases through grand jury, we have to arraign those people. Then they're put on the active docket. And from that point, you know, it's just we have a what we call a motions docket where we try to resolve anything that's outstanding motion wise, but it's also a status docket. So, you know, if the case is ready, we try to say announce it ready so that the next trial term, that defense lawyer, that defendant knows that their case can be set. Um, and what we try to do, I mean, I've never seen any value in trying to blindside people or, you know, try to catch them unprepared. I mean, that just doesn't do anybody any favor. So um, what we try to do is once once we have that status docket and you know what cases have been announced ready, we've always done what we call a, a trial short list where we put together a list of cases and we say these are the cases that we're going to resolve this next term of court. And we send that out to all the defense lawyers that are on that list. That way they get plenty of time to run their clients down, prepare their defense, talk to them if they want to plead. And that's work for us. I mean, that, that keeps cases moving. I think it feels like it gives both sides a fair opportunity to, to do what they need to do. Um, and again, you know, it doesn't catch somebody's surprise where they trying to go in and defend a case without any prior notice. Well, just uh, so out of curiosity, um, let's say you have a capital case, and does Alabama have the death penalty? Yes. So if you, if if you determine at the beginning that this is worthy of the death penalty, would you plead bargain something like that? Well, again, Steve, you know it's one of those things where um, it depends on how strong your case is. Um, you know, there there are certainly cases I've got capital cases pending right now that, uh, in earnest, I believe probably the defendant deserves the death penalty but whether or not i've got strong enough evidence to to get it to that point you know is what what we'll evaluate as those cases get close to being set for trial um there's very few cases that we actually seek the death penalty in my circuit um it's it's rare that we do uh most of the time even in the capital cases um you know we will take death out of it and and we were prosecuted as a capital case but they'll know that the you know if they're convicted the sentence will be just life without so um it's it's not very often that we pursue the death penalty so is that written in statute or how much of that is how much of that do you weigh to determine whether or not to make it a true capital case and seek the death penalty i mean i know the law says there has to probably be things like certain aggravating factors you've got to meet certain things but even if it's met there's still kind of a qualitative decision above that, right, for you to determine, like, yeah, it's kind of met, but then you start looking at your evidence or maybe the factors of the case. So, you know, how do you struggle with that when you determine? I mean, that's uh, because the reason I ask is I, I think back to not that it influences you, but you know, you're thinking about, man, you escape, you know what it's like to escape death. I mean, literally. And now you're sitting here thinking about we're going after something that could result in some, you know, the, the death sentence. So, when you make those qualitative decisions, how do you struggle with that? You know, do you struggle with it or what do you do or how do you how do you approach it, you know, from a philosophical standpoint of determining what you're going to do? Well, I mean, obviously, you you know, you've got to appreciate that it is the most serious form of punishment that exists. Um, and it's not something that you should ever pursue. I don't even think charge uh, capital murder unless you know the facts and circumstances and, and the evidence warrant you doing that. And there are those times, Morgan, I mean, like I give you an example, you know, some of the, 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 the capital murder statute itself has changed over time. It's changed since I've been in office um, back in the, the, the explosion of crack cocaine and all the drive by shootings that started occurring as a, as a part of all that, you know, every state, I think, added uh, a capital offense that that involved if you're in an automobile and you discharge out of an automobile and you kill people then it's a capital offense and then the vice versa if you get killed if you're if you shoot into a, a, a occupied house uh, and kill somebody in a drive-by shooting uh, it's a capital offense and, and it, again it was it was solely to try to cut back on those types of shootings because they were so prevalent in the in the height of the the cocaine uh, epidemic that, that came along in the 80s and the early 90s so you know there's times when we may have those facts um, you could charge it capital if you wanted to and we choose not to um, but now if it's the if it is the you know the the actual drive-by, we're just spraying bullets, 
you know, we're just trying to make a statement because this is our uh, rival drug, you know, group or whatever, then yes. I mean, we would certainly charge it. But then if it's just a, one somebody and you know their motive is to get one, one person, you know, you might might exercise a little discretion and not charge it capital. Because, again, I, I don't think you charge it capital just because you can. I mean, you, you've got to understand the seriousness of it and appreciate the seriousness of it and not charge it if it doesn't need to be charged. So so take a case that same exact facts. One is that you're going to go after the death penalty. The other one is it's a capital case, but you're just going to seek life. Does your preparation for the case change much or what extra has to go into it when you've got a death, a true death penalty case? I mean, a death penalty case, a, a capital case certainly is more involved. I mean, it's more involved for us. It's more involved for the defense uh, attorney. You, you know that if you if you end up with a conviction, a capital murder conviction, it gets reviewed differently on appeal. Um, there's That's an automatic things. appeal after after guilt, right? That's right. And, and it's a different standard uh, of review. So there's just a lot more hoops you got to jump through. There's a lot more things you have to be careful about doing. Um, I've told people, you know, from from my perspective, not to speak negatively about any defense lawyer I've worked with over the years, but, you know, in, in a case like that, you have to be as aware of what they need to be doing as you are of what you need to be doing, because if they're not doing something that you know is just going to bring it back up on appeal or Rule Thirty Two, you know you you've got to prompt them to do it. Otherwise, you just go through all that for nothing. So it it is more complicated. Um, a lot more work goes into them, um, but you know aside from that, they're pretty much the same. That, that's a, uh, I've never heard it described that way. And I know our listeners, a lot of our listeners are curious about, that's why we're asking these questions. But, but you, the fact that you've got to make sure the defense attorney is doing his job, because that brings up the, def, the, 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 his client's claim afterwards of ineffective counsel, if he doesn't do his job correctly, that, and then you got to right. go through the whole damn thing again. Yeah. I mean, there's no sense in doing that. Not if, not if you can prompt them to do something that hadn't been done. I mean, you know, you just, that, it just makes sense to do that. Otherwise, you're just doing it for no reason. You're just going to come back and do it again. Hey, players, that is the end of part one. Part two comes out, as always, on Tuesday. In the meantime, go check us out at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. Also, go check out our website, GameofCrimesPodcast.com. We've got a lot more information there, including our book list. Any book written by our guests will be listed there. In the meantime, go check us out also, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. It's where we put a lot more content you won't hear on our regular podcast. We go into a lot more topics, and folks, it is a lot of fun. So go check us out, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. In the meantime, everybody stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow for part two.